Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. A teacher who survived the Texas elementary school massacre is telling us what happened inside his classroom the day 19 children and two teachers were killed. What he says about the moment the gunman entered the room and his message for law enforcement. Plus, the clock is ticking as Congress tries to reach a deal on gun reform. We have the latest on the growing debate and potential compromise in Washington. And we're taking a look at the new National Gun Violence Memorial in Washington, D.C., featuring more than 45,000 vases with flowers representing the American lives taken each year by gun violence. Earlier, former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who herself is a victim of gun violence, spoke at the memorial. Stopping gun violence takes courage. The courage to do what's right. The courage new ideas. I've seen great courage when my life was on the line. Now is the time to come together, be responsible. Democrats, Republicans, everyone. We must never stop fighting. Fight, fight, fight. Be bold, be courageous. The nation's counting on you. And all day, ABC News is taking a closer look at gun violence in America across all of our platforms. And we will begin with that exclusive interview of Uvalde fourth grade teacher Arnulfo Reyes. Reyes says his class was enjoying end of school year celebrations when a gunman entered his classroom, killing all 11 of his students. Now he's describing it all to our Amy Robach and a warning, what he says is very difficult to hear. I said, if I die, don't let it be in vain. Arnulfo Reyes, the fourth grade teacher in room 111 at Robb Elementary School, telling his story for the first time as he recovers in the hospital from two gunshot wounds hit during the horrific massacre that took 19 students and two teachers' lives. It was our typical morning and, um, you know, we ate breakfast together. It was going to be a good day because it was going to be our day of awards. And some kids in my class said that hadn't gotten an award you know, all year, we're going to get an award that day. Reyes says the children were enjoying the end of the year celebration. And while some students went home after the ceremony, 11 from his class stayed behind. They were watching a movie when all of a sudden gunfire rang out. The kids started asking out loud, uh, Mr. Reyes, what is going on? And I said, I don't know what's going on, um, but let's go ahead and get under the table. Uh, get under the table and act like you're asleep. Um, as they were doing that, and I was gathering them under the table and told them to act like they were going to sleep, is about the time when I turned around and saw him standing there. The gunman entering classroom 112 at 11.33 a.m., then making his way into 111 through a connecting door, opening fire. Reyes shot twice, a bullet hitting him in the arm and lung, and a separate one striking his back the 17-year teaching veteran hitting the ground. I told myself, I told my kids to act like I'm there asleep, so I'm going to act like I'm asleep also. And I prayed and prayed that I would not hear none of my students talk. Did you, you, you thought you were going to die? Yes, ma'am. Then while the gunman was still in the classroom, Reyes hearing police nearby. According to law enforcement, seven officers were in the building by 11.35 a.m. They took gunfire and retreated. Reyes says a child in the connecting classroom, 112, called out for help. One of the students from the next door classroom um, was saying, officer, we're in here, we're in here. And then, uh, but they had already left. And then, um, he got up from, from my, behind my desk and he walked over there and he shot over there again. The gunman going back into room 112 and firing more shots. At 11.58 a.m., children from other classrooms seen evacuating the school. At 12.03 p.m., a child from room 112 calling 911, telling dispatch where she was. By this point, 19 officers were inside the building, but no one went in. At 12.10, 12:13 and 12:16, more 911 calls. Is there anybody inside of the building? Is he is in the room full of victims. Full of victims at this moment. Parents outside begging for police to save the children. You know that there are kids, right? They're little kids. They don't know how to defend themselves. You said you were praying. Do you remember what? 
you were praying for, what you were saying in your prayers? I prayed the Lord's Prayer. I prayed my Hail Mary. Reyes says eventually he heard officers come back, telling the gunmen through the door they want him to come out to talk, that they don't want to hurt anybody, but then silence again. More 911 calls, including from Reyes's classroom, but it isn't until 12.50 p.m., one hour and 17 minutes after the gunmen entered the classrooms, that Border Patrol busts in, killing the shooter. After that, it was just bullets everywhere, and then I just remember Border Patrol saying, um, get up, get up, and I couldn't get up. Did you feel abandoned in that moment by police, by the people who are supposed to protect you? Absolutely. After everything, I get more angry because you have a bulletproof vest. I had nothing. I had nothing. You're supposed to protect and serve. There is no excuse for their actions. And I will never forgive them. I will never forgive them. How many students were in your classroom when the shooter came in? 11 students. So the shooter killed every single student in your classroom? Yes, ma'am. That's when I got you thinking, you know. This family lost one. This family lost one. I lost 11 that day. And I just went to my parents and I'm sorry. I tried my best. Of what I was told to do. Please don't be angry with me. Reyes says no training could have prepared them for this. Even though the school had extensive protocols, he says laws have to change. It all happened too fast. Training, no training, all kinds of training. Nothing sets you ready, gets you ready for this. We trained our kids to sit under the table. And that's what I thought of, you know, at the time. But we set them up to be like ducks. You can give us all the training you want, but it's us. Uh, gun laws have to change. It won't never change unless they change the, the laws. Reyes says he doesn't think he can ever return to a classroom, but he's making it his mission to honor the lives of his students and two of his fellow teachers. The only thing that I know that I will not let these children and my coworkers die in vain. Absolutely, I will not. I will go anywhere to the end of the world to not let my students die in vain. They didn't deserve this. Nobody in this world deserves this kind of pain. No mother, nobody deserves this. I will go to the end of the world to make sure things get changed. Mr. Reyes wants people to know those two teachers who lost their lives, Eva Morales and Irma Garcia, were awesome, amazing educators. And he wants the parents of their students to know they, too, tried to do everything they could to protect their students. And you heard him say it's now his mission to see change. Well, what he wants to see is the legal age to buy a gun raised. Diane? Yeah, he said no one deserves this, and that's for sure. Meanwhile, lawmakers are scrambling to make a deal on gun violence prevention measures before a self-imposed deadline. Negotiations on Capitol Hill have previously encountered stiff opposition, even after mass shootings. But lead Democratic negotiator Senator Chris Murphy says he's more hopeful for success now than ever before. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from Washington. Hi, Rachel. Well, senators met late into the night. Democrats do not want to let these talks drag out. They want to reach a bipartisan deal on gun reform by the end of the week. So here is where negotiations stand as of right now. Several Republicans have signaled that raising the age to purchase a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21, remember that's a type of weapon that was used by the suspects in Uvalde and Buffalo, is likely off the table. Many Republicans are against this. They either believe that the age is appropriate or they say that 
that decision should be left up to the states. But senators are considering ways to strengthen background checks by possibly allowing juvenile records to be screened if the buyer is under the age of 21. Also on the table, incentives for states to enact red flag laws, which would temporarily take guns away from people considered to be dangerous, and funding for mental health and school security. Congress is under immense pressure to get something done on the issue of gun reform. Actor Matthew McConaughey, who was actually from Uvalde, was here on Capitol Hill pressing lawmakers, asking for change. And today, in the Senate, the son of the 86-year-old woman who was gunned down while grocery shopping in Buffalo will be testifying before Congress. Diane. All right, Rachel Scott, thank you. And as lawmakers in Washington try to reach a deal on gun legislation, many young people are using their voices to call for action. Founder and CEO of the Conversationalist, Sophie Barron, and March for Our Lives Youth Congress member, Ruquan Brown, join me now to talk about the importance of including Gen Z in this conversation. Thank you both for being here. Sophie, I want to start with you, because your, your whole shtick is you try to foster safe spaces for Gen Zers with different point of views on a lot of hot button issues. So what are you hearing from Gen Z about the recent mass shootings across the country and the debate surrounding them? Thank you. Thank you for having me, Diane. I wish it was under better circumstances. Gen Z right now, although not a monolith, it's impossible to generalize what an entire generation is thinking. A majority of Gen Z is in favor of stricter gun laws. 70% of voters under the age of 30 want stricter gun control reform. And so in this conversation right now, I'm seeing Gen Zers across the political spectrum bringing different ideas to the table. For example, we are seeing an example set forth for us by our politicians and lawmakers with a lot of finger pointing, blaming and name calling, whereas our generation is truly coming to the table with a willingness to listen. Although we may have different conceptions of the solution to solving the gun violence issue, we agree unequivocally on both sides that this is an issue that needs to be solved. Now, Ruquan, March for Our Lives is a student-led movement that supports gun control legislation. It was launched in 2018, just about a month after the Parkland, Florida school shooting. Why is being a part of this movement so important to you, and what kind of change are you hoping to see? Well, first, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to represent uh, not only March, but all of the people in our country who care about our lives and care about us having an opportunity to experience life at the grocery store or at school and at all of these common activities that Americans should be able to safely partake in. Um, it's really important for me to be involved in this fight because I've been experiencing gun violence since I was five years old. I'm 20 now, so that means I have 15 years of experience with this particular trauma. It's really important that, uh, to mention that what we're looking for is for all of us to be able to be safe in our country. And um, some of us are looking for stricter gun laws, right? We wanna raise the, uh, age from 18 to 21. <clears throat> we want Congress to pass universal background checks. We want to be safe. We uh, know that um, guns are, uh, are really, really, really negatively impactful on our safety. Um, we also know that it's a lot deeper than that. So we're looking to also expand the conversation to not only guns, but why people even feel the need to pick up a gun and use it violently. Um, another thing that's really important is that this isn't a conversation just about pro-gun or anti-gun, but most importantly about pro-love and pro-peace. And so it has less to do with um, uh, what, but more to do with why. Sophie, do you think that the country in general has done a good job of including Gen Z in this conversation? And, and why do you think that's so important? That's a great question, Diane. And Ruquan, thank you for sharing your experience. In my opinion, I think as a generation that is experiencing gun violence firsthand. I think Maxwell Frost, who could be our first Gen Z member in Congress, even coined us as the mass shooting generation. It is more important than ever to include us at the table. And if I'm being completely honest, I haven't seen a lot of Generation Z representation in the room where those conversations are happening. I think our generation is doing a great job of taking action. A majority of Gen Zers can't yet vote. We're organizing 
organizing protests like Ruquan is doing with March for Our Lives this weekend in D.C. We're organizing national walkouts. We're starting these dialogues in any way we can, but it's going to take intergener intergenerational dialogue to make our voices truly heard. So I think we are seeing more and more young people take action, step up to the plate to use their voices, but it's going to take members from every generation to bring us in and create a seat at the table to actually affect change for a generation that is inheriting this issue firsthand. And Ruquan, you're describing, I mean, years and years of having firsthand experience, exposure to gun violence. So what do you think is the most effective way to raise awareness about that kind of violence and how it impacts you, the, you know, the person, uh, children growing up in this environment and, and people around them? Well, I think that um, certainly marching works. Um, the states listen to us when we march. Uh, last in 2018, there were more than 150 laws passed in our states um, to help us be safer. And so that's the beginning, I think, is for, um, like Sophie said, interge intergenerational work to come together or for all of us to come together across generations and work together because we all have experiences um, uh, with hate, uh, with death, and with these things that we shouldn't encounter so often. I think that the way to continue this movement, the way to keep this conversation going, is again, to not focus so much on what, but more on why. The truth and the reality is that so many American people are losing our lives um, at the hands of each other. But what we haven't really explored as a nation is why is that happening? And when this nation is responsible and was built on hate and violence, it makes sense that in, in today's culture, those things still exist. And so what I think Gen Zers need to be responsible for with these other generations is spearheading this conversation about love, about peace, becoming more familiar with that as Americans, because Americans are not as familiar with love and peace as we should be. We're very familiar with politics. We're very familiar with academia. We're very familiar with business, but we're not very familiar with how love intersects with those things. Once we are able to have that conversation, I think we'll be successful. All right, Sophie Barron, Ruquan Brown. It's a conversation I wish we didn't have to have, but I feel very honored that you joined me to be a part of it. Thank you both. Thank you, Diane. And tonight, you can watch our ABC News Live special, Guns in America, from Buffalo to Uvalde. That's an 8.30 Eastern at 8.30 Eastern, 9 Pacific on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Coming up, voters in seven states are heading to the polls for today's primaries. The key race is to watch and what it could mean ahead of midterms when we come back. Welcome back. Voters are headed to the polls today for the busiest primary day of the election season. Seven states, California, Iowa, Mississippi, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, and South Dakota are all holding elections today. California alone has 20 key races to watch, and 538's election analyst Jeffrey Skelly is tracking it all for us. He joins me live now for more. Jeffrey, uh, I know we could spend all day talking about California alone, um, but first off, can you talk about the system? Because the primary system in California is different from most other states. So how is this top two system working? Sure, so most states, uh, the parties hold separate primaries, but in California, all the candidates run on the same ballot together. And then uh, the top two vote getters, regardless of party, advance to the general election. So sometimes you can have races where two Republicans or two Democrats advance. Uh, and in some cases, uh, occasionally in competitive seats where you would expect a Republican and a Democrat to advance, uh, one party can sort of accidentally get locked out if uh, there's kind of a crowded field and two candidates from the other party end up advancing ahead of a much more crowded group of, say, Democrats or Republicans. Now, obviously, too many races for us to cover them all. But what are some of the top tier races you're keeping your eye on? Sure. So there are a lot of statewide races. Um, Gavin Newsom, the Democratic governor, looks like he's going to very easily advance the general election and probably win re-election uh, handily. Uh, Alex Padilla, who's the appointed U.S. senator there, he's on the ballot for the first time for Senate. He succeeded Kamala Harris uh, when she became vice president. He looks good. And really the race I'm keeping an eye on is the attorney general's race. And there you have appointed attorney general Rob Bonta, a former state legislator, who is running against a couple of Republicans and an independent. And, you know, Republicans 
haven't won a race, uh, a statewide race in California since 2006. And so no non-Democrat has won since then. But interestingly, there you have an independent, Anne-Marie Schubert, who might be able to advance to the general election and give uh, basically non-Republicans a shot, or not Democrats, I should say, a shot of winning uh, a general election there for the first time in a very long time. Now, the midterms bring with them a battle for control over Congress. There are about 10 seats that could go either way in November. So what are you watching for on that front? Gosh, yeah, there are so many races there. So uh, one I'm keeping an eye on, though, is uh, Republican David Valadeo's uh, California 22nd. Um, it's a Central Valley seat. It leans Democratic. But Valadeo voted to impeach Trump. Uh, in 2021. And unlike most Republicans who did that, he hasn't really faced a serious primary challenge. But it's possible that his main Republican opponent, Chris Mathis, might be doing better than we, we might have expected, uh, because there's been a lot of outside spending right here at the end in that race. So there might be some concern about him on, on the Republican side actually challenging Valadeo. Um, there's also uh, three Democratic incumbents I'm keeping an eye on to see who, which Republicans will advance to face them. Uh, it's Mike Levin and Katie Porter down in Southern California in the Los Angeles area, and then Josh Harder in the Central Valley. Um, because you know these are races that, even though they are slightly Democratic leading seats in a Republican leaning midterm environment, they could they could potentially flip. Now, our latest ABC News and Ipsos poll shows the most important issues for voters nationwide are inflation, the economy, gun violence, and abortion. Is there a read on how that's likely to play out at the polls? Well, I think you know California voters, very similar to to uh, voters in other parts of the country, are definitely concerned about inflation, about the state of the economy. Um, maybe climate change. Obviously, there are a lot of wildfires uh, in California. Uh, but I think also there's we've seen some California-specific polls that have shown things like homelessness are a concern. Um, and so if you're thinking about that attorney general race, for instance, you know, crime, homelessness, things that are concerned, someone who's more of a tough on crime candidate might be able to, to do better, uh, potentially. So thinking about Anne-Marie Schubert's independent bid, maybe that's a way for her to break through. All right, 538 elections analyst Jeffrey Skelly, thank you. Thanks for having me. Coming up, the U.S. is pressuring billionaires with Kremlin connections, now targeting the planes of a Russian oligarch. How Russia is responding and the latest from Ukraine when we come back. Welcome back. The U.S. is intensifying its efforts to punish Vladimir Putin and his supporters now moving to seize two planes thought to belong to powerful Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich. Now this comes as street battles rage in a key eastern Ukraine city. James Longman has the latest. The U.S. is tightening its grip on Vladimir Putin's inner circle. Federal prosecutors are moving to seize these two planes they say are owned by Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich, who allegedly moved them to Moscow in March, violating sanctions put in place by the U.S. In response to the American sanctions, Russia is issuing travel bans to 61 U.S. citizens, including high-ranking government officials and top business leaders. With Russia's blockade of Ukrainian ports ongoing, a walkout at the U.N. Security Council, Moscow's ambassador unhappy at being accused of weaponizing global food supplies. You may leave the room. Maybe it's easier not to listen to the truth, the ambassador. In the east, Ukrainian forces are still locked in a grueling effort to fend off Russia's onslaught. Putin's forces have taken huge swathes of territory, but in Severodonetsk, the Ukrainians say they've mounted a successful counteroffensive and pushed back the Russians to the eastern part of the city. But the secretary of the National Security Council, Alexei Danilov, has told ABC News that it will be difficult for Ukraine to win this war without speeding up the supply of modern weapons. The country is ready for long-term resistance, he said, because we're fighting for our freedom. New long-range weaponry from the U.S. and now the United Kingdom to Ukraine is intended to defend against this, Russia's relentless bombardment of residential areas. Well, Russia may be making huge territorial gains, but they continue to suffer significant losses. Russian state television is reporting the death of General Roman Kutuzov. Now, if he really has died, he'd be the fourth Russian general to have been killed since this invasion began. Diane? All right, James Longman in Ravine, Ukraine, thank you. I'm Diane Macedo. Stay with us as our day looking at guns in America continues after this. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.